Matthew chapter 21, if you can stand with me. Uh, some of you, maybe you came from a different background. Maybe some of you came from a Catholic background. You're like, what's all this standing, sitting? Now, I just want, the, the reason lately I've been having a stand with the scriptures is because sometimes I do think we lose reverence. And so I just want to, in a simple posture of standing, that as we read the scriptures, that this is God's holy, set-apart word that's been given to you and us, preserved, protected, and passed down from generations and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So here we are, Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Let's read it again. Well, let me read it to us. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna in the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they are, these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Let's pray. God, this is your word. It is holy. It is set apart. It is good. And it's your word that points us to the central figure of the whole scriptures, the star of your whole story, which is you, Jesus. And so, Lord, as we read and as we study, I pray that you'd open our hearts and that you would speak through me with clarity and with effectiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now let's get some context of what's happening here. Again, anytime you read the Bible, especially if you're not starting in the beginning of a, chap- or of a, of a book, it's good to read the verses before and after. And so what we talked about last week is Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That last week we talked about, he's about six days away from the crucifixion, getting ready for the Passover, and Jesus sends two of his disciples to go ahead and to get this colt to bring back, and they put their cloaks on this colt, and Jesus rides on it while all the crowd and his disciples, they praise and they worship, saying, Hosanna, son of David, and they put their cloaks on the ground, and they wave palm branches as he enters into Jerusalem, declaring this is the Messiah, this is the son of David, the awaited messianic or Messiah king, the king of the Jews. He's here. Now again, they were still not fully understanding that this king wasn't going to come and rule and reign in the way that they thought, but rather he was setting up his eternal kingdom. So here we are in chapter 21, verse 12, that now Jesus is in Jerusalem, And he enters into the temple. This place that for the Jewish people was a place to worship God. It was a place to come and bring your offering to God or to have a sacrifice offered on your behalf. This was a central location of Jerusalem. The pride and joy. Because it was supposed to be where God's presence dwelt with his people there in the holies of holies. But it's almost like they lost sight of their worship and it became something else. Let's see what happens here. So verse 12, it says, And Jesus entered the temple and he's confronted with something to the reality that makes him unhappy that he drives out all who were selling and buying in the temple. He overturned their tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So let me, let me kind of give you a picture of what's going on. Because sometimes I need a visual, uh, I, need, I need to see something to kind of get my bearings of how something works or what I'm reading about. 
So if we can see one picture of the temple area here. Now, if you look to the, uh, on your screens there where it says the court of the Gentiles, this would have been the main area where Jesus entered. Now, in this court of the Gentiles, both Jew and Gentile were welcomed. Now, I also want to give us some understanding here. This is the week in preparation for Passover. So thousands upon thousands upon thousands have made their journey to Jerusalem in preparation for Passover. This courtyard, this court of the Gentiles would have been packed, filled. And yet when Jesus comes into an environment there that's filled with all of this buying and selling this robbery, and we'll explain what happened in a moment, but I want to break down some of what we're seeing here. Because the court of the Gentiles is the scene that we're being talked about here with this cleansing that Jesus drives out. That's the place. It's the outer court. This is where Jew and Gentile, this is where the blind and lame could come. But there were merchants there. There were sellers there looking at an opportunity to make an, a, a quick buck. You ever go to an Eagles game or a sports game where you're getting charged like $3, $4 for a bottle of water or a hot dog that feels like it's 10 bucks, and you're like, that better be the best hot dog in the world. This is what's going on. So this outer court, the court of the Gentiles, now if you look at those pillars all the way around there, these were often places where Jesus would teach. And so this happens, but then if you see, I want to move us forward though, then the, the court of the Gentiles were not allowed to go into what's called the woman's court. Any Jewish man or any woman was allowed in this woman's court. But if the Gentile, any Gentile walked through that, it was death. It's why in Acts chapter 21, the Apostle Paul is falsely accused for bringing what they thought a Greek in with him into this territory that a Gentile was not allowed to. And he would, there was a whole riot that unfolded and, and Paul was arrested. Now, I also want to help you see something. The court of the women, what's interesting in that, um, that place is where Anna prayed. Remember Anna prayed when, when Jesus was born? And she's in the temple and she's praying and she would worship there. That after her husband died, she was a widow until her 80s. And it says that she would spend day and night there praying and worshiping. That's that story. Or the poor woman that gave of her might, the two mites, and she gave all that she had, she gave in that area. Even the encounter with the adulterous woman that the, the religious people bring in and they're like, Jesus, what do you have to say about her? And he said, he who's without sin cast the first stone. Most likely would have happened in there. Now, and then you see in the big opening where it says altar beyond that big doorway, only Jewish men could go in there. The court of the, the, of the court of the Israelites. But then you went further in and only the priests could enter. And then you got to the main area, the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could enter once a year for atonement for the people. Now think about this for a second. This is, like, this is where I love because the court of the Gentiles, Christ did on the cross broke down that barrier that allowed even a Gentile to have access to God. The court of the women's court. What Christ on the cross brought the woman equality that Jew or Gentile, man or woman, slave or free, are one in Christ. And so you have this temple that was meant to be a place of worship and of prayer and the court of Gentiles is filled. And so Jesus drives them out. He drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. First we see in the text there, what did he do? 
that those who bought and sold, they were buying and selling, these were, they were driving out. They, they saw it as an opportunity for robbery. In essence, they knew the outsiders, people were coming from a far distance to come to bring worship and offering and preparatory for Passover. And so what they would do is like, oh, we can provide the animals. We can provide their grain. We can provide their gifts. We'll just charge them a whole lot more. And so people bought into that where rather than bringing their own gift as their own offering of worship to God, we can just get it there. Because for some, there was fear that on their journey, their offering might get a broken leg. And if we remember, our sacrifice had to be what? Without blemish, without spot. And so these men were charging way beyond and really just stealing from people who were coming with a desire to worship, whether Jew or Gentile, coming to give an offering, coming to worship, and they were getting ripped off. Rather than people excited, these religious leaders of the day, excited that people would come to worship, they're seeing it as an opportunity to fill their pockets. See, Jesus wanted Israel to offer its own. To not purchase a sacrifice in a temple, but to bring an offering of worship. It was even the school of Hillel that believed that the offering should be their own. So they had this idea that, that as long as they bought the animal there, that, that was, they, they, they allowed it to be okay because they saw, well, as long as that person puts their hands on the animal, then that would be declared their own. As if they're giving it of their own. So Jesus comes in, finding this buying and selling in the core of the Gentiles, this crowded place where people are seeing it as a lucrative opportunity for business. Last year, my family and I, we like to go to Florida once a year, um, and it's not really to go to Disney because we really can't afford Disney. Uh, we just found some places that are just nice and restful to hang out by the pool. But last year, we did decide to take the kids for one day. Now, for you guys that take your kids the whole entire vacation, I don't know how you do it. I, need, I would need a vacation from vacation if I did that. But we did decide to take our kids to Animal Kingdom for the one day. One day. One, because that's all we could afford. Two, that's all I can handle. All right? And we tell our kids, when we go to Florida, we have them start saving their money because sometimes we'll go to Disney Springs where they want to go to the Lego place and buy a set of Legos. But our kids also brought money to go to Disney, to Animal Kingdom. And we're in one of the gift shops, and you know they, 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 lay, they, plan, they plan it out well when they build parts of Disney because what happens when you're done each ride or experience? There's a gift shop. So we're in this gift shop, and my son sees these sunglasses that he wants. And I hate seeing my kids ripped off because I don't like getting ripped off. These sunglasses that you would have found at a dollar store were, were, I, I, I think they were anywhere from, I think they either, I, I remember there being a seven. It was either 17 or $27. I think it was more to the $27. And I'm trying to talk my son out of these glasses. I'm like, listen, and Misty's like, he brought his money. We told him they can get, I'm like, I know, but he's getting ripped off here. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say we did let him buy the glasses. I think he wore them that afternoon, and I've never seen him touch them again. Right? But that God's, that this place of worship and prayer has been a place for the religious to see it as lucrative business rather than a place of worship. So Jesus overturns the tables also. Not only does he, he remove these people that are, that are selling, but he also overturns the tables of these money changers. The money changers were the ones who converted the standard Greek and Roman currency into the temple currency. But in that, there was a charge. 
the half shekel temple. And so even that, they saw, hey, here's an opportunity that we can charge them even more for this transfer. And then it says that Jesus even overturned the seats of those who sold pigeons. Jesus is angry. Angry because of what he's seeing. These people that are supposed to be representing God, representing his house, are the ones who are taking and selling off of those who are coming to worship. So Jesus took action. Now, here's what's interesting. Do you know the family line that the priests in the Old Testament, what family line of, of what tribe of Judah did the, did the priests come from? Levi, or, or the Levites. Jesus came from what family line? Judah. You would think, why didn't Jesus, if he didn't have the priestly con- credentials, Shouldn't he have gone in and talked to the priest or the high priest and got permission before he made this ruckus? Or is what he's doing, in essence, this action that he's taking, showing that he is greater than the temple and greater than the high priest? That he's t- he has the right. Why? Because he's lured over the temple. In John chapter 2, in another account where it tells a story where Jesus comes into the, um, into the temple to clean house, look at what they, they ask Jesus in light of what he's doing. Look what happens in John 2, verse 18. It says, so the Jews said to Jesus, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews are like struggling with that statement. The Jews said, they said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So let's go to verse 13. So Jesus says to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. It's meant to be a place of prayer, of worship, not of thieves. In in Mark chapter 11, Uh, Verse 17, Mark gives a little bit more description about this place, this temple. And he says, and he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. In Isaiah 56, verse 6 through 8, it says, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides these already gathered. If any man or woman of any nation or any tribe that wants to come and give worship to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are welcomed. But this place, filled with all of these, all of the Jews and Gentiles, for many of them have made this travel for Passover, fill the courts of the Gentiles. I wonder what that space, like think for a second. Jesus starts flipping tables over. Money and coins are getting flung around. Benches with birds are being flipped and birds are let loose. Wonder what that scene started to look like. The chaos. 
for some of the religious leaders, what's going on? It's that Jesus guy again, man. Why can't we get rid of this guy? And you'll see in the text that it says that they become indignant, so angry that I really believe this is one of those things that really leads to his crucifixion. See, the temple was the designated place that God had established to his people for his presence to be and for worship to happen. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 11. It says, then to the place, the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell, dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your contribution that you present, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite that is within your towns, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Look at verse 13 of that. He says, take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you should do all that I am commanding you. This place, this place is where you're to worship. This is the place where you are to come. This is the place that's also open for the Jew and for the Gentile. What you'll see is what's interesting here is this almost seems like Jesus' judgment upon ethnic Israel in their hardened hearts and they're not accepting him as the Messiah. And not too much further, in AD 70, the temple would be destroyed by the Romans. Now I want us to think about something for a second. I had a conversation with a Jewish man not too long ago. And he asked me a pretty difficult question right up front. He says, do you believe that Jews are going to hell? And I had to lovingly and gently, but yet truthfully, say yes. If a Jew has not trusted in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, then because of their unbelief, then yes. And so we conversed about some other things around this topic and I feel like the Lord kind of gave me a question to ask in that moment. And he didn't really have an answer in that moment, but I think it was a question that I, that I praise God for because I asked him, I said, if the temple has been destroyed, which we know was destroyed in AD 70, and you don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, then what are you trusting in for your atoning of your sins? Again, the temple was the place where sacrifices were offered, where the high priest offered once a year for the atonement. And if that has been destroyed and animal sacrifices are no more and they don't believe in Jesus, then there's some type of disconnect here. Then what are we trusting in for our atonement? But these last couple of verses, I want to take us because I want us to see the beauty of Jesus. Jesus is Lord and greater than a temple. Jesus has broken down the dividing wall, the hostility between Jew and Gentile. There's so much that Jesus is. And so one of the things I want us to see, look at verse 14. He cleans house. But look who he gives time for. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Man, like, are you guys seeing a theme throughout as we're going through Matthew? I know we've been in Matthew forever, and we'll probably be here for a little while longer. But man, are you seeing the heart, the compassion, this mercy that comes out of Jesus? 
Like I think often of the text that the Bible says that God gives grace to whom? The humble. But he resists the proud. Here's the blind. Here's the lame. The sufferer and the sinner, Jesus makes time for. But the religious, arrogant, prideful, we don't need God because we have our traditions. Because, look, we, we bear the name of Jew and Israelite, a Hebrew, so therefore me and God, we're tight. No, you've just been blessed that I called you, and through you I would bring the Messiah. But you've missed the one that the law and the prophets all point to. He's the one that I've sent to redeem you. And you're missing him. But the blind, the lame, they come and he heals them. He shows them compassion and mercy. And this would be one of the last times that we would see part of Jesus' healing ministry happen except for the guy that Peter cuts the ear off of and Jesus heals the guy's ear. (laughs) To be honest with you, I think for a lot of the Jews, the lame weren't welcomed in that area. Jesus, the one who's Lord over the temple, made space, made time, and saw them, healed them, and touched them. Do you remember when John, John the Baptist, when he's arrested? He sends, John the Baptist sends two disciples to to Jesus with a question. Almost like needing reassurance. And, And the question that these two disciples bring on behalf of John is, hey, Jesus, are you the one who is to come Or shall we look for another? And in Luke 7, verse 21 and 22, it says that in that hour, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them. So now this is what Jesus, so Jesus in front of these two disciples of John, he heals all these people. And then now he responds to these two guys, say, hey, I want you to go back to John and remind him of this. Go tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. This was a prophecy of the Messiah and what he would come to do. So, when Jesus is healing all throughout his ministry, he's not reiterating his deity. He's rather revealing to them that he is the Messiah, the Christ. And how sad is it that the nation of Israel would not see or believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but the sinner and the lame And the sufferer, they come with humility and they believe. They experience his healing and most of them believe. Lots of them believe. So look at verse 15 as we close these last couple of verses. It says, but when the chief priests and the scribes, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, When the chief priests and the scribes saw what? What did they see? Wonderful things that Jesus did. And they even hear children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. This is sad. Time after time after time, the Jews in that time have no excuse. They had prophecies. 
and prophets that foretold. They had the law. They had all of these things, and they even had the embodiment of God's presence walking among them. They see the miracles that testify to his, that he's the Christ, and they're indignant, they're angry. Their hearts are hardened. And then there's these children. These children that Jesus often welcomed. He made time for the child as well. These children that are singing these songs, proclaiming these statements, Hosanna to the Son of David, the same phrase that the crowds were singing and shouting and adoring Jesus as he's entering Jerusalem. Jerusalem. In the midst of the crowds in this court is voices of children. Children, picture your kids. Hosanna. It's Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Imagine these little kids in all their innocence and joy just pointing and and almost dancing and laughing free to just, hey, Hosanna. Hosanna. And then the religious people who can't see, angry, stoic with this external hard surface because their hearts are hardened. Not remembering that the scriptures even said in Psalm 8 that out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength or praise because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So verse 16, and Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read that out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city of Bethany and lodged there. He most likely lodged back at uh, Martha and Mary and Lazarus' house because they lived in Bethany. They're about two miles outside of Jerusalem. But that phrase, leaving there, has some connotation to almost judgment. Leaving them. Almost like this judgment upon ethnic Israel who cannot see But at the same time, what salvation was meant for the Jew, the Jew first, but also for the Gentile. So let me hit with a couple of points as we close up. The temple was no longer the mandated place of worship. Because of what Christ has done on the cross and his resurrection, the temple is no longer the mandated place of worship. The second thing I want us to understand is that Jesus replaced the temple. Jesus replaced the temple. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tents, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing, what? Thus securing an eternal redemption. The sacrifice of bulls and animals was a one time, but it had to be repeated. But Christ was both the high priest who could offer it, and he was also the perfect sacrifice that could give us eternal redemption, payment for our sins, Complete cleansing. Verse 13, he says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons, which the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God? So how much more will it? It will purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In Revelation chapter 21, 
in the very end, when we, his children, who have believed and trusted in Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile, there will be a day when God, when Christ makes a new heaven and a new earth. And look what it says here at the very end of the scriptures. Verse, chapter 21, verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, "Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be with, they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God." He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then we skip down to verse 22 in that text. Look what it says. And John writes this, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And then it says this, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk. The nations walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only these, those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus is Lord over the temple. The temple is no longer needed. Why? Because Jesus is our high priest. He is the temple. He is the perfect sacrifice. Everything that we need and everything that the Old Testament and Jerusalem was to testify and to point to was the Christ. He has come. So I close with this last verse. Ephesians 2, 11 to 14. He says this, the Apostle Paul, he says, Therefore remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, you were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but look at verse 13 but now but now but now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near how by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, what? One new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Those temple courts had all of these separations in Christ, in Christ, there's no separation between us and God if you've trusted in Jesus. And whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, there's no more separation because the common bond that we have is Christ and his spirit living in us. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus, guys. It all points to Jesus don't get caught up in religion and your traditions to the point that you miss Jesus. He's the one. He is the way to the Father. 
He is, the, he is the life, the one that gives us eternal life, and he is the truth. No one comes to the Father except through him. There's no good works. There's no sacrifice you can offer. There's nothing you can do except call upon the Lord and trust in Jesus who died on your behalf and rose again. Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you called upon him to save you and to have mercy on you and to forgive you and to transform your life? It's all Jesus. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your word today. That God, that that Jesus, you are supreme and Lord over the temple. That you are the one who came to break down that wall of hostility. That the Bible says that we as sinners are at odds, that we are enemies of you, God. But through you, Jesus, and your death, we can be reconciled with you, God. That Jew or Gentile can be brought into the family of God. Where we are adopted as your children, fully loved, fully accepted that we can enjoy peace with you and peace with each other. Jesus, thank you that you care for the sinner and the sufferer, that you came to bring life and redemption and healing and salvation. I pray, God, that like these children who cry out and sing out Hosanna to the Son of David, I pray that, God, you would give us that childlike faith and childlike worship that we would declare the praise that you are deserving. And Jesus, thank you that we wait for the day that you will return, that you are the temple that will live and dwell with us. And we can come and go freely and worship and praise you, O God. Thank you for this life, this eternal life that we have been blessed with, all because of you. In Jesus' name, amen.